Welcome to Carrying Wayward, a supernatural podcast for fans who aren't ready to let go and newcomers to the series who are ready to jump in. I'm Drew Shulman. And I'm Marie Vigourou. In this episode, we're joined by Jeremy Greer from Monster of the Week and Non-Human Biologics as we dive into Supernatural Season 8, Episode 8, Hunter Heroicai. Huntery Heroicy? Huntery Heroicy? Well, anyway, let's just get this show on the road. Jeremy, welcome back to Carrying Wayward. Thank you. I love the new intro music. I love what you've done with the place. We hired your guy, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta say nothing but good things about Jake Lionheart. He's the best. Thank you for the recommendation. We love his work. Drew, I have a question for you before we get kind of in too far into this. I just listened to, um, I think the latest episode y'all have out is on the first episode of season eight. And you said at the very beginning of that that you were very much looking forward to uh, having more flashbacks to explain... <laughs> what's been going on i haven't obviously you guys have recorded 8x2 through 8x7 and i, I haven't listened to any of those so i don't know what your current status on flashbacks is but i'm i'm dying to know how, where you're at on flashbacks they still haven't gotten bad enough yet to make me understand mary's such like thorough distaste for them they're barely in this episode and i was like oh god i remember all of these and i hate them so much <laughs> Every time the, sc the, the screen just goes blurry and it's just, uh, I hate it so much. It's fucking Sam with his feathered hair. I think it was two or three weeks ago. There was like uh, the, during the Garth episode, there was like a really egregious one that I was like, OK, come the fuck on. <laughs> They've been like decent bits of story that I've like actually been really excited to get to. So I'm, I'm a little more OK with them. I was shocked because I hadn't watched this episode and probably five or six years now uh and i was shocked when i such, it, we were on episode eight and we're still getting flashbacks i thought they were kind of wrap that up in the first five episodes or something and we're still de dealing with amelia and all of her problems and the random dog and the dad and everything else so very funny to me i texted mary as i was watching this episode i was like i'm laughing so hard i can't breathe my face hurts this episode threw me for a loop in the best way the courtiness of the transitions, I think, really got to me in the flashbacks. Like, if, like somebody says, like, you're living in a dream world. And, and Sam just, like, looks in the distance. <laughs> and, like, just fades out. And thinks about, like, a dream world moment. Boom! Amelia flashback. <laughs> it's so, so corny. It's how silly getting to the flashbacks are. It's, like, the forced setups. But then, like, they've also been, like, useful, like, information. So I'm like, I can live with this. I didn't personally like the fact that they told the, particularly the Amelia story through flashbacks. And then somebody was like, well, I think the reason why I particularly hated it was the fact that like, we know that he's no longer with Amelia. And so you're not getting invested in that relationship. And I was like, oh, okay, okay. I get it. I get it. Cause I'm like, I don't mind Amelia. I don't hate her the way a lot of people hate her. And I'm just like, I don't really get why people don't like identify. Cause I identify with Amelia a lot. I wanted to know how does it end? Like, what? Why did he leave her? Like, what was the exit? Why was there? A, was it just a mutual breakup? Was there more to it? As I was watching it, I was like, God, that this is so boring. Like, I just need to be past all of this. Get back to the get back to the good parts of Supernatural, please. The parts with Dean and Cass. That's the that's the savior. Somebody from the production of the show, I think it was a director or something called Supernatural, the Dean and Cass show. And I was like, finally, people are catching on. Like, my God. Oh, we've been saying this for years. <laughs> Both as like Dean Cash shippers, but also like poor Sam kind of like doesn't get the best writing or like storylines. Spoiler alert, like you're, you're on that journey for a while. <laughs> poor Chris started out as a hardcore Sam fan and just like as over the years just was like. <sighs> <laughs> I love that transition, although like it was really against his will. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah, absolutely. It was very begrudgingly. So today, as you can hear, we're making some small changes to our format. So as usual, we're going to go through our recap and our long game, and then we're going to go into our theme conversation. We're going to skip critical time altogether and the voicemail, and we're going to go directly into our reflection and call to action. 
This week, patrons and coffee supporters get to hear the outtakes from this episode in true Monster of the Week fashion. We put all the video game talk in the outtakes. So this will be on our supporter exclusive Impala Talk feed. You can go to carryingwayward.com to support us and claim your perks. So we've been talking about this episode quite a bit, but only very specific parts of it. So Drew, would you like to give us a bit of a recap? Sure. Count me down. Three, two, one. Meep, meep. We have the most out of left field, ridiculous, like literal Looney Tunes of an episode as the brothers are trying to figure out what's going on with these like weird cases that seem to have very cartoonish antics going on until they find an old buddy of John's, an old hunter who had psychic powers, who's now, you know, kind of not all there anymore and having trouble handling these. And in his attempt to tune out and forget the world, he is accidentally emanating Looney Tunes energy. Sam gets some flashbacks. We learn about Amelia and that her husband might still be alive. Uh, But ultimately, they talk this guy into a better place, even though it kind of ends really sadly with Cass and with an overly violent ending. But um, everything seems to be fine. And Cass seems to be getting a little bit more. What's going on with me and how am I going to handle myself? Time. Jerry, do you have anything else to add about what happens in this episode? When when you, you and I talked about doing an episode of season eight, I was picked this episode because of the Looney Tunes part, because I thought. The last episode uh, Chris and I guessed it on was the, the fairy slash aliens episode, which was super appropriate. And then this one has that same kind of wackiness that Supernatural is really, really great for. What I had forgotten is all of like the really delicious Dean Cass stuff that's around this, around all of the wackiness. There's the moment where they're in the hotel by themselves and Dean like literally reaches out as like, are you OK, man? Like, please talk to me. And it's like you never see Dean do that with Sam. Like with Sam, he's just like, you're OK, you'll be fine. Like he kind of insisted. But with Castiel and, um, and some later characters, I don't remember where they come in the series anymore, but like you see him kind of taking on that role of like, let me let me help you like through this problem. And it's just it's just really good to see. I mean, I feel like we even see it a bit with Benny, even like with like the, the lengths he goes to, like, even just in these few episodes I've had so far, of Benny, there's a level of like connection to him that he like will go out of his way to help. It wasn't just like, let me find you support. It's no, no, no let me ditch my brother and abandon him and drive miles away to go rescue you from a barge that you nearly died on, and then help you finish your, you know, revenge goals. Yeah, Dean cares about his boyfriends. He does care about his boyfriends. Yeah, he does care about his boyfriends. Whether they're broken up or not, like, he cares about them, you know? This episode was written by Andrew Dabb. This is his first without Daniel Laughlin. It was also directed by Paul Edwards. This is his only one for Supernatural, and it originally aired on November 28th, 2012. Always so intrigued when we get like one-off directors. How do they get there? What is their connection? What else have they done? I just find this really interesting. The fact that this is the first time that we're seeing like Andrew Dabbs writing, like, I don't want to say unfiltered, because as we know, like scripts go through like the writer's room. They go through like a lot, a, a very lengthy process. But like this is without a writing partner. So just very interesting that this is the first episode that we get. Kind of a preview into the into the dab era, right? Like just with some of the conversations that happen. Exactly. (laughs) If this is his work on his own, I am very intrigued for more of it. Uh, We're going to go into the long game for a little bit uh, just to kind of like point out a couple of things here, because I just have to say that I love that this episode starts with like a road so far montage that makes a direct parallel between Sam and Amelia and Dean and Cass. Who is the secret agent, right? That's on in season eight of Supernatural that's putting these montages together to make us think the same thing. But it's not, it has to be on purpose. Like I've, I've, I've edited video before. You don't do this by accident. I'm very convinced like there was like a small sect of like people in the team who were like, oh no, we truly know where this is supposed to go and they're just not letting us talk about it. So we'll be subtle And with each season, they're a little less subtle about it. And this is, again, one of those moments of like, let's just be very blunt and do this. And hopefully no one gets mad at us. Like the pizza episode. But anyway. We do get some rare Sam and Cass interactions this episode, which I assume we're going to be talking about a little bit later. But suffice it to say that this is not the last time that Sam and Cass will find themselves in an imaginary place. Or like a fake place-ish. I'm in such an X-Files era right now that I'm just like having to retrain my brain and remember everything that happened in this dumb show that I love so much. There is actually an X-Files reference in this episode, which I was so tickled about. Like, I was so excited. 
Dean does like the Mulder thing and he gives like his, well, his fake FBI business cards. And like, he's like, you know, call me if you think of anything, which is like such a Mulder thing to do. Like he does that literally throughout the series. Anything spooky. <laughs> anything spooky. <laughs> and the, the cop like refers to him as Agent Scully as she leaves. And it's just... <laughs> And you can tell Dean is like, mm, <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> he was going for a very specific vibe and didn't get there. But it also had the vibe of like that motel, that like hotel or inn episode where he's like, why do people think I'm gay? And he's like, well, because probably because like, you know, and Sam just like lists the reason why <laughs> and he's not happy about it. So I do want to focus on a couple of like really throwaway lines here where like Dean is trying to get Cass to get a room. Well, to get his own room, not like that, but anyway. And he goes like, well, I need my four hours. And Cass replies, well, I'll I'll watch over you. And honestly, like, I love the delivery of that because that could have contained like, don't worry, I'll watch over you in it. And I I do want to mention that there is a very well-established fan interpretation out there of this moment that when Dean would sleep in purgatory, Cass would watch over him. And like, this is actually so well-established in fandom that people think that Jensen Ackles agrees with this or believes this as well, because he wrote a song called Watching Over Me that is supposedly or confirmedly about Cass watching over Dean. I remember when this, this, that album came out and like the Monster of the Week Discord just blew up and everybody was like talking about these songs. And I'm like, I don't know. What are you guys talking about? What is this? What is going on? <laughs> exactly. I don't listen to I don't, I don't, I don't listen to this music. Tell, tell me what's happening. Let me read the lyrics. So. He said, like, there's a song about Cass and like, obviously, like watching over me and people were like, that's the one. (laughs) That's the (laughs) one. (laughs) Since we're talking about throwaway lines, there's one earlier where they kind of mentioned what Kevin's been up to with Garth. And they talk about the safe house boat. (laughs) It's a running monster of the week gag. So I I have to bring it up. But like, there's just the the safe house boat is one of my favorite things to ever come out of Supernatural. Like no one is safe. No one is house. No one is boat. I love the safe house boat so much. And like even Sam, I think, has a like. Garth has a houseboat? She's like, I don't know, man. (laughs) It's really funny because I personally find that in this episode, like, Jared is not particularly good. However, I do love that it gives Sam, like, such a specific outwardly appearance. Like, I don't know if this was the direction or whatever, but there was something different in Jared's acting in this particular episode. I don't watch the episodes. I listen to your guys' episodes talk about it. I haven't been watching with, along with y'all. There's a fair criticism to be laid of the show where they just don't give Sam a lot to do. So when people compare like Jensen's acting and Jared's acting, like Jensen usually comes up because they give Dean so much emotional like stuff to work through. And in this episode, it felt like Sam had stuff to do. Like it felt like he was he was part of the team for, for finally. Like, and I don't know if that's been like happening in season eight as it's going on or if that's something that continues to to happen during this the season. So. But in this episode, I noticed the same thing. Like he kind of had a a little bit more of a vitality to him. We also get a very brief glimpse of a blue cross that takes on a symbolism in a later episode. We do get the iconic line, I'll interrogate the cat. Classic. Jeremy, you mentioned this at some point. I can't remember, remember if this was like during the episode or during the outtakes, but like you mentioned that like it's really great to see Dean and Kaz like working together. And I have to say that I got really strong like free to be you and me vibes when I saw them working together again. And I just I loved that. It was very nostalgic and I loved it. It's nice to see the two of them just trying to be like they're both going through a bunch of shit right now. Like uh, Cassiel especially like he even talks about it like I can't I can't go back to heaven because of what I did. Dean is obviously like dealing with his own emotions about coming back from purgatory and having a new boyfriend and dealing with Sam and then have them to kind of meet in the middle and be like, it's very like, to me, it's as as a dude that's been married for a long time. It's, it's, it's very like coupley, right? Of like, we're both having issues, but we're going to meet each other in the middle and try to figure out each other's issues for one another. And that's what like the meeting in the hotel kind of feels not meeting in the hotel, but like being in the hotel room together feels like. Like getting a room, you know, like. Yeah, like getting a room. (laughs) And then just the whole concept of Castiel being like, I'm a hunter now, right? Like, I, and, and, Dean, and Dean being like, this is my life, dog. Like, you can't just decide to be a guy that I, I've trained my entire life to be. And like, he's, he's like vaguely supportive, but also like, no, you're not really doing this right at the same time. It's just so very funny and good. And of course, Misha rocks the whole, the whole concept. Dean's energy in that was very much like when a child tells their parent, like, I'm going to be this now. And you're like, sure. Uh-huh. Last thing is that we find out that Don is alive. Don being Amelia's supposedly dead husband. He is alive. Drew, what did you think? Because like you found out about this like for the first time. 
the reason I was still enjoying the flashbacks, the reason I was putting up with them and still like, even though getting to them is shitty, the actual content, it was like, I want to know more about this. We kind of get Dean's whole story now. We know what happened in Purgatory. What happened to Sam? Like, he seems to have found somebody and a life and a house and a dog that he hit with a car. Where do we go next? And now we're finding out that there's trouble in, I don't want to say paradise, but trouble in this. In Dreamland, how about that? In Dreamland. You know, you talked earlier, Mary, about like not hating on Amelia like a lot of the fandom does. And I don't particularly hate on the the character at all. Uh, And I find like she's a very good mirror for where Sam is at this point in his life. Like just them both going through heavy emotional trauma. And I think she even says this to her dad, right? Of like, I I haven't felt good in a long time and I feel good when I'm around and let me feel good with my boyfriend or whatever. But man, just like this entire plot line just feels like it's just like distracting from the main part of Supernatural. Like the Sam Solo stuff has almost never worked for me ever. Um, It's only when he's like with one of our guys that I like. I I like when he goes on his own adventures. I think it's also particularly upsetting because like we know that Sam is making a mistake. We all are Amelia's dad in this in this scenario, right? Where we're like, this is not what you should be doing at the same time if you've been in that place or in a similar place you can also realize that this is exactly where they need to be in order to not be in that place anymore but we know that it's going to end and so it's a difficult place to be a difficult difficult like space to inhabit when you're seeing your friend doing something that you're like this is not actually good for you or this is a phase like it's amelia's line that let us be a mess together it didn't even occur to me then, but like right away that is like very much admitting like, yes, I know this is bad, but we both need this for now. So this is likely temporary, but like, let us have it. We also know that the reason she's a mess is because of her dead husband. And, you know, if that goes away, is she still a mess? And does that mean that she doesn't need Sam anymore? One to which we might have an answer at some point this season. <laughs> Maybe they will wrap up this plot line. This week, our theme is make-believe. So here we're using make-believe as a noun, like with a hyphen between the two words, which means like pretense, false, or fanciful representation. And it seems to have appeared in this form around the late 18th century, and it was mostly to talk about like children's games. So like let's play pretend kind of thing, which like is so appropriate for this particular episode, I think. Oh, fully. So the main question that we're kind of going to talk about is like, where do we see make believe in this episode? Right. So I, I listed a bunch of stuff, but like if there's anything that kind of comes up for you guys, like by all means, like let's let's get us started. When you said make believe and we actually almost like got to it a bit in our in our long game, Cass playing Hunter almost feels like make believe. He is just looking for an excuse to not be himself for a little bit. And I just thought that was a very interesting like catalyst in this episode. Like Dean is supportive and, there, and therefore Sam is supportive because if Dean is supportive, then, de- then Sam will be as well. Sam usually follows. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so there's like this understanding like, like, oh, okay, this is what he needs right now. So let's just go ahead. And I think that that's such a contrast again to what Sam had gone through with Amelia, where like he was playing make-believe to a certain degree, right? They're both pretending that this is going to fix, their, fix themselves. I think anybody with just even a cursory knowledge of mental health issues would be like, nah, fam, like that's not like you don't. Yeah, the, the sudden relationship, the, the, the all of those intense emotions, like that's not fixing yourself. That's just distracting you from the problem, um, which like you, you mentioned, Drew, like it's almost like that's what she wants in, in this, which is the, to be that mess together. But they're both pretending that it's going to work in some way. Um, and I think even if the dude didn't come back from the dead, like, that relationship would have probably imploded at some point or another. Cause like neither one of them are bringing their true selves to it. They're playing make believe to each other to be the other person, what they think the other person needs as opposed to just being themselves. One would eventually stop pretending and realize they need the support and help and growth that they've been ignoring. And that means the other one likely wouldn't. And even if they both had that realization, the reality likely would be, we need to leave each other so we can both go recover and heal properly. Also, Amelia would probably find out like he's using most of his bartender money to buy hair products so that he can keep his hair all feathery <laughs> and realize like he's he's not going to contribute to rent. Like he can't afford rent. He's got he's got seven bottles of Aveda products on the shelf. What is this? It's so funny because I recently re-listened to like your Monster of the Week episode where like you talk about him moving in and you're like, who's paying <laughs> who's paying this mortgage? And you're like, it's certainly not Sam. <laughs> not Sam. Yeah. 
never paid a mortgage in his life. <laughs> I love that. Riley doesn't like, even yeah. know how to spell mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> I just imagine like for how smart as Sam is, they're sitting there and she's like, okay, we have to pay for this house. And he goes, pay for a house. You just kill all the vampires that didn't need to live in it for a month. Like That's how I get out of the house. <laughs> I can fix it up for you, baby. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, don't worry about the blood and the and the weird nest. We can fix that. It's no problem at all. We can clean it. It's okay. And all that hair in the drain. The dogs? The dogs. Sure. How is Dean playing Make Believe in this episode? Because when I saw your notes uh, earlier today and I was reading this, I was, and I, as I watched the episode, I was trying to think about like how he would be kind of pretending and what he, what he would be pretending. Because he, throughout this episode, he kind of feels almost like in a way that I hadn't seen in a long time, because again, I haven't watched Supernatural in a while. He seemed very, very genuine throughout. Um, so I'm curious what your what your opinion is on that. When there's an episode like this, like I, I'm reminded of like the cowboy episode, for example, where Dean gets to like live in a fantastical element that he is like more excited. Like as, as soon as he puts together that it's cartoon physics, he is like elevated to a level of like, this is new. This is exciting. This is fun. And I think it's just it's this moment where we almost get to see that this is when he's not pretending. This is when he's genuinely interested and not just going through the motions. He is actually enthralled, which makes me feel like that all of the rest of the time he's hunting, he is very much doing it because he thinks he has to almost like he's playing a part that he's being forced to do. Like you said, Jeremy, like. Dean does seem incredibly genuine in this episode in a way that like we don't often see him being genuine and open. And I think that that creates like such a contrast with what we've seen. I was going to say like in, in the season so far, but really like throughout the entire run. Exactly. Like the mask that he wears, like whether that's like in terms of like his gender identity, his like sexuality, his just like who he is as a person, really like the 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 voice like lowering and lowering and lowering with the different episodes, you know, like I think that has something to do with it, too. And the fact that like he just sits down in that motel room and just like goes, Cass, like, talk to me. Like he's trying to connect with Cass in a way that we don't really see often. And Cass responds well to it which had been difficult like in since season six, right? Where they like had their big falling out over Cass, you know, the betrayal and whatnot. I just find that that part of the relationship is pretty genuine. I do wonder if maybe Dean isn't playing like a support part, like for Cass in his game of make-believe that everything is fine. Just to mirror the Amelia Sam relationship like they did in the the road so far, where Dean could be pretending to be what he thinks Castiel needs, which is like, hey, somebody to extract these emo- these these feelings, these thoughts from you, right? Like I'm going to be that person right now, even though that's not really in his normal wheelhouse um, yet. Because I feel like over the over the course of the series, like he becomes more of that person. He becomes more of like a mentor slash like person that he wants people to rely upon in an emotional fashion, not just in a save the world kind of way. I think it's almost an interesting level of like hypocrisy from Dean, because I feel like so often I give him shit for like not making the right choice of like, or like the double standard sometimes of like treating people one way, but acting a different way. And I think here his letting Cass kind of make believe and play and sort of just like going along with it and like humoring him is his way of saying like, this is how I would want to be treated. I just like, I don't want to talk about it. Cass doesn't want to talk about it. We're not going to talk about it. I'm going to let Cass do what I do. And then it's finally that alone moment in the hotel room where he's able to be like, I'm seeing now how bad this is and why people don't let me do this. Cause it doesn't work. I'm going to talk to Cass. And the irony, you know, if anyone tries to do it to him, he's going to like turn around and yell at them. It's much easier to call out people out on their bullshit than being called out on yours, right? A hundred percent. There's a part of the episode that we haven't really talked about, which is um, Castiel. I don't know if this was the first, I think, I don't think it can't be the first time like we, you met Naomi and, and, and her kind of like positioning Castiel as being this like um, secret spy or whatever. But like, this is almost like a forced make believe for Castiel who doesn't remember those times when he comes back to earth, right? Like he's does not realize what he's doing until he goes back up to heaven. Um, and that's emphasized at the end when he like has this moment of realization when, when Fred talks about when they're in the episode, they would talk about like being your true self or whatever. And, and Castiel is like, I know what I have to do. And like instantly gets brought back to heaven by Naomi. And she's like, no, <laughs> absolutely not. 
and then sends him straight back down again again that forced make believe of like he thinks he has control over what he's doing he thinks he's going through all of this stuff but in reality he's kind of being like strung along with as a puppet he's being inception did inception did it be an inception duh Cass is being strung along and like inceptioned in that way really makes me think of of Sam's storyline in earlier seasons of him like not really having a choice and like all of his choice having been dictated by like different demons that like came into his life and again like it it just makes me think of like how close Sam and Cass's storyline have been or how parallel they've been because like the whole like Sam going dark side and then Cass like betraying Dean both of them lying to Dean. And we heard that, you know, a couple of episodes ago when he's like, the only person who's never betrayed me is Benny. Benny's also been around for five minutes, Dean. (laughs) (laughs) Give him time. He's his Amelia. (laughs) (laughs) And so it, it kind of makes me think about in this episode, how both of them are having realizations about their past or their current situation, right? So like Sam is having realizations about what happened with Amelia, but Cass is having realizations about him needing to face the consequences of what he's done because there's that moment when he's talking with, with Dean on, in the motel room where he says, you know, I'm afraid that I might kill myself if I'm confronted with the consequences of my actions. And like, there's a part of me that's like, oh, wow, like, like suicidal ideation is like a big thing to talk about. Like, and so it, like, there's something to talk about there. I feel like facing the consequences of your actions is also something that we should all have to do, right? And so there's like this tension for me that's present that I find really interesting. I can't tell if it's um, clever or ham-handed to go directly from the Castiel's like suicidal ideation into like the second kill of the episode, which is a guy trying to kill himself by jumping off of a building, right? Like we go, we go right, right from one to the next almost. Like it's, it's pretty, they're pretty clearly connected. And Again, can't tell if that's ham-handed or, or, or relatively clever <laughs> because it's even though it's because it's a gruesome idea, uh, but it's played as funny because of the Looney Tunes aspect, right? Like when he steps off and he's like he doesn't realize or, or whatever, like he looks down and it's ah, um, but it's also like extremely gruesome. And that's one thing about this episode that I, I find that I like is like all of the kills are extremely gruesome. Like they like it, it, from the very beginning when the dude's heart explodes, like she is covered in blood and blood spatter and and. They do a great fake out with the cake. She's got blood in her mouth. Like, ah. <laughs> Talking more about the suicidal ideation thing, like even in the, the way they deal with the, the quote unquote monster, like when Fred forces him to shoot himself, right? Like that's even like kind of plays into that whole. Hey, Dab, what are you doing? <laughs> Dab, Dab, you have, I have questions. <laughs> I always have questions for Dab. In any other episode, like Sam and Dean, Sam and Dean would be hunting this guy, right? Like they'd be hunting this dude. He's a friend, though. Remember that. Ah, I know. I know. And this is kind of where I wanted to go. I'm glad you're bringing this up because I find that Sam and Dean, like the second that they start knowing somebody. They can do no wrong. And it makes me think about that poem that somebody sent in about Supernatural when it's like, who is a monster? Like something like that. When you, who is not a monster? Somebody you know, somebody you love. And it's like, oh my God, I can't believe that they, and, and I mean, to be fair, Cass did do some thing to him. Magical angel lobotomy. But I find it really interesting also that like throughout the episode, we're seeing a lot of like cartoonish violence. And so to have that very, very like realistic, gruesome and like, of course, this is a CW, so we don't actually see the gun go off. But like to think that he is dying by his own hand, like unwillingly is so incredibly like awful. And I think that there's a a, a difference there, right, between like the, the cartoonish violence that we had earlier versus like this incredible act of violence. And I think that that truly is the worst part of the episode, right? Like the violence or like the the thing that is actually done, like in cold blood to this dude. I wonder if they did it just specifically to justify the upcoming lobotomy. And I would like just to say like, oh, we have to deal with this guy. Uh, We can't just leave him to. So we have to take away his brain power or or whatever. Um, I had a big problem with this when we covered it for the episode, because I I liken this a lot to Castiel taking um, Sam's like weird mental like health problems away from him and i think even season six or seven because like i just really disliked that like i really like i would want if they're real 
then deal with them. And if it's like fake Lucifer, then deal with fake Lucifer through like witchcraft or whatever. But like, don't just take it away. And then all of a sudden Sam's fine and Castiel has to stay in the mental home or whatever. And this feels very much like that, right? Like it feels almost like the exact same thing where he just took away this dude's agency, even though the guy asked for it. The idea of this like magical fix they decide to do for, for Fred. I, I think what it does though, is it, it, it's showing Cass has the power to do this for somebody, like even something as dramatic as this. He has that power, but he can't fix himself. Like given that how he's been feeling this episode and what he's been trying to do and make believe and get around it. I think that if he had the power to do this to himself, the way he did to Fred, I think he would have done it. I also have a problem with how quickly Cass goes from like suicidal ideation at the mere idea of facing consequences of his own actions to like, I have to go back to heaven. And I think that there also like, there's a question for Dab about how quickly that happens and like how different or how at different ends of that spectrum, those two things are. And it makes me wonder, like, where's the part about the make-believe? Like, was Cass really ready to go back to heaven? Like, is that really what he was going to do? Or did he, was he trying to like fake it till he made it in this particular circumstance? I don't know. Just like Dean with hunting, there's no escape. I'm going to keep hunting till my last days. Cass knows I'm going to have to go face the music in in heaven and go deal with it. So I don't think he wants to or is ready to, but he's just going to bite the bullet and go. Imagine being millennia years old and coming down and meeting Dean. And then just the the primary lesson you learn is like, got to do the thing. (laughs) Fate forces me to do the thing. I got to do the thing. (laughs) Like, that's the thing that you learn from Dean Winchester. I mean, I feel like that's the thing that a lot of people learn from Dean Winchester. (laughs) If there's one thing you can say about Dean is that he is driven to complete the task in front of him. Whatever that task may may, may be. I want to switch gears a little bit because I want to come back to that X-Files reference. Because as you all know, as you have publicly advertised, Jeremy. We have roasted you several times. Yes. People tagged me in the server. They were like, oh, Mary, you're getting roasted on new <laughs> <on your laughs> biologics. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> so there's that X-Files reference in this episode. And I'm kind of wondering about like how much, because Supernatural and the X-Files were shot like both in Vancouver. And yes, that is on the West Coast, Jeremy. Yes, I just learned that. <laughs> Learning facts about Canada at, at 43 years old. <laughs> we are on the East Coast. <laughs> so on the other side. <laughs> Mary's on the East Coast, so she's in Eastern time. I'm further East, and I'm in Atlantic time because I'm Easter than East. You're Easter than East. I love it. And then there's Easter than Easter East, Newfoundland. And their time zone is an hour and a half ahead. The Louisiana public school system is 49th in the country. Like the state motto is thank God for Mississippi, so we're not last in everything. So they're both shot in the same area. And I'm kind of wondering, like, and I've heard, you know, that they share a lot of DNA. I definitely think so as well. But like in your like exploration of the X-Files, like what are you finding in terms of similarities? Like and how much is Supernatural trying to like make believe that it is like the X-Files, you know? It's been interesting because uh, I have a lot of memories about the X-Files that turn out are like just like random episodes. Um, So I like I've never because of the way. And I was, you know, 13, 14 when these episodes were coming out originally. I love the show, but I, like we didn't have DVR. There was no streaming. Like none of that stuff existed. Like I wasn't renting VHS tapes of the X-Files or anything. I would just catch it every once in a while. Um, and I've learned watching like I've barely seen any of season one. So it's been fun to kind of go through and like just get all of this new experience. And what surprised me the most is how little the overarching plot, the mythos, the myth arc, as they call it how little that kind of is even in the first season, right? Like there's only been a couple of episodes that have even touched on stuff that I know they're going to touch on later. And it reminds me a lot of Supernatural season one, where you would have, where they introduce kind of the basic premise. And then they're like, every episode is a new monster. (laughs) Like we're just going to roll. And like, that's, that's how X-Files is, right? Like, it's like, Chris describes it as um, like every script. It was like a movie turned into a TV show. The way they use lighting, um, I think is very, very similar in the first season. Uh, Supernatural gets away from this and I understand X-Files is going to get away from it as well from when they move from film to digital uh, but like just the, the, the kind of way they use light and dark um, throughout a, a given episode is really really similar you can tell the people that were making Supernatural had studied genre television and I think X-Files probably was premier among the right like because you, you can see even a little bit of like Twin Peaks uh, stuff in, in, in Supernatural and you can definitely see that in, in the X-Files I mean 
David Duchovny was on Twin Peaks, so that makes a little bit more sense. And of course, you know, you have the dynamic between the two main leads. Like we just met Skinner in the X Files. Like so, and I understand that he's going to become like the Castiel of the relationship. And I'm very curious. I don't think that's actually accurate, but like close. <laughs> I mean, certain shippers would agree. <laughs> There's a lot of crossover in the production teams, like writers and, and, and directors and things like that. Um, some people that we know very well, like got their first episodes, like their first TV credits working on the X-Files. So like definitely some of that bleeds over. And I think the X-Files was such a huge thing just in terms of pop culture. Like everybody knew what it was, like even if they weren't watching it, right? Like it, it was one of those moments that you very rarely see in pop culture nowadays. Um, the last one I can remember was probably Lost, where like everybody was talking about the thing, like right. And I feel like X Files was very similar, where people were like X Files and da 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 da, like it was it was crazy popular. One thing that I find really interesting is that I'm thinking back to the last episode that you did with us, which was like the 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 fairies episode, which was also like a little bit of make believe, but it was very much about the X Files. And I'm thinking back to that line where Soulless Sam goes to the um, the UFO hunter and he goes, "You've been hunting these things for like 30 years, and you have nothing. Have you considered that you're perhaps not very good?" And I'm just like, "That was that a line for Mulder?" Like. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one of the things I like, I love about the X-Files is um, they always leave room to show how intelligent the two main, main leads are. Like Mulder is always like, there was a case in 1963 where a pyrotechnic, blah, 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 blah. And Scully is, and, and Scully is the same way. Like, Scully will pull out some crazy stuff on, on her own. So I was really moved and like kind of giggled when I heard like Cass's understanding of the Roadrunner. You know, when he's like, oh, you know, the Roadrunner is God and like the coyote is, is man and, and like trying to chase him, but like ever so elusive. And it just got me to think about like how our own experiences really influence, like how we see and how we understand the media that we consume. But also like how we interpret like that kind of make believe, right? Like that, that kind of media. And I'm just like, oh, Cass, you are one of us, you know, like you are one of the fans who's looking at Supernatural and like absolutely looking at the little tiny things. Where is Castiel's four hour Looney Tunes podcast? I was about to say that's what yes. I want. <laughs> like, I just want a breakdown of every single Looney Tunes episode, like in chronological order and him just going crazier and crazier and crazier. Jeremy, I don't think that this is something that you talked about at all on Monster of the Week, but there is a very, very active fan theory that um, Amelia isn't real, okay? And that she is purely a figment of Sam's imagination, that he made up his entire, this entire year with her. And there are a lot of people who subscribe to this theory. I personally do not, but like, I find it really interesting to entertain a little bit because this episode really like, would be if I were to argue that that's a thing, I would use this episode to show it because like, like you said earlier, Jeremy, like there's this thing where he's like, oh, you can't say he's this guy's in his own dream world. And like Sam, like, boom, Amelia flashback, you know, <laughs> like, oh, he's in his dream world. I love that like fans are still trying to come up with like theories that fit inside canon. Man, how depressing is that for Sam Winchester? Well, so that's kind of why I don't like it. If it's true, like, that boy is way more broken than we ever thought. I had a theory for a while. I tried to make this work in season one of Monster of the Week, where, or not season one, whenever Lucifer was first introduced, that most of Supernatural just takes place in Sam's head as like a torture from Lucifer. And it's, it's proven, this, I don't remember what episode, but like I really wanted to keep that as a theory because I was like, that would be just mean that this dude is just being tortured for like 15 years. And that sucks for that guy. And then the dog doesn't exist. That's sad that you're making up fake dogs. I love how that's what you take away from that. The dog is fake. Oh, my God. <laughs> the dog is my favorite one in the flashbacks by a country mile. Like the dog is easily the best character. It, like right away, the idea of like make believe finding your own imaginary world to live in your head to like cope with things you couldn't cope with. Making up things that like misremembering things, right? We talked about that in a few other episodes where Dean misremembered something that happened. Like this could also kind of play into the game. And I also like the line when they talk about Fred being psychokinetic because Sam was also psychokinetic, right? If we remember that in earlier seasons and they say something like, I mean, an average psychokinetic can move things uh, with his mind, but a guy like Fred, you get him worked up. He can reshape reality. And I think the line before that is like, he's got juice. And when they talk about juice, they often talked about like power and where did Sam get his power from demon blood, right? And that's what made him able to move things around. And I was just like, this is crazy. Are they aware of what they're saying? Like, I don't know. I just... 
it all fits together well it will i like amelia i like that story i i want like as much as i know it's not a happy ending i i like for sam there was some level of like i got to be normal for a little bit a lot of this works in a way where I understand why it would be a fan theory. And while I don't subscribe to it, it does hold a lot of ground. If we really want to dive into like the sadness of all of this, like, and I'm going to make you guys all depressed, but like cartoons is where Fred feels happy and safe. And what we're seeing for Sam is the fact that like playing house is where he feels happy and safe, which is something that he's never had. And so he's imagining or like in within that theory, he is like imagining a whole world where he feels safe. And it is the polar opposite of anything he's ever had. Well, this is the second time we've seen Sam with a dog, too. Right. Like that's that's a big thing for him is to have like the stability of a home life in order to be able to support a pet. If you're on the road with John Winchester constantly, nobody's going to put up with dog in the Impala. Right. Like that there's going to be it's going to be impossible. One thing I did want to mention since I just brought up John Winchester. There's two John Winchester references in here. Uh, one, of course, is, you know, that he's Fred's friend and that they knew each other. But the other one is Castiel because he's reading John's um, journal and he tells Dean, your, your, your father had beautiful handwriting, which is just if you've ever seen the journal, it's not true whatsoever. <laughs> like, I don't it's just chicken scratch at best. And I don't. But it's fascinating to me that Castiel, like, was reading that. And that's the thing that he tells Dean. Right. Like, it just it shows such a much of like. He just wants, like, he thinks that that's going to make Dean happy, right? Like, it's just another thing to, to tell Dean to make him happy. And I don't, I don't know where it comes from. I don't, this is it's such a weird line, but I, I just, I love it so much because it just, it's so, it's such a weird line and it fits all of the other stuff that we've been talking about of trying, them trying to be like little support networks for each other and not really knowing how. I see it as one of those things where it's like, I don't think he's seeing it for beautiful as in like the way we would consider like beautiful calligraphy beautiful. I think he sees it as beautiful in like the emotion behind it and which I know sounds weird for John, but in the same way that like he sees like the mystic, the mysticalness and just the bees flying around doing what they do, seeing this chicken scratch, this like the artistry of just like putting thought to paper and like condensing all this information, like not to speak to its quality, but just that there was a passion behind the writing. There was like a purpose. Also the dedication, right? Like that it took him years to build this thing and he kept at it. Like he kept adding to this, this journal to, to, you know, presumably help his kids. It's full of wrong information, but whatever. <laughs> it's the thought that counts. Like me when I try to bake something like it's, it's admirable that you tried. <laughs> it doesn't taste good. It's funny because I had never really stopped to think about that. What I thought was interesting is the fact that like Cass is allowed to touch Dean's things, right? Like there's this moment where he like pulls out like a thing from his bag. And then there's like, he's reading his dad's journal, which usually is like an item that's really reserved for family, right? It's reserved for Sam and for Dean. But Cass is allowed to touch that. And he's allowed to handle it in a way that like, Dean wouldn't let Garth handle Bobby's things. But Cass is allowed to handle John's things. And I just think that there's like a, such an intimacy there, obviously. Absolutely. There's something about like Cass looking at these things, like this story of Dean's past and kind of like thinking like, oh, wow, Dean was there when John was doing this. And, and like kind of thinking, again, the mystical ability of the bees, like that's that's kind of, you know, how things are related. And like I, it felt like Cass in that sense. Right. I firmly believe that if Cass and John ever met, Cass would punch him in the face. Like, I truly believe that. Cash who could not hurt anyone. Like, yes, he exercises demons, but like couldn't just punch a person. He would find a way to break that rule for John. I think he would definitely like look at Dean for permission, right? Like he'd be like, you know what I'm saying? Like he'd give you like one of those like couple looks of like, do you want me to get, go off on this motherfucker or what? What are we doing? <laughs> He's like, I could, I could. <laughs> I will unleash the beast right now if you need me to. And Dean's just like, just chill out. Just chill out. Just be cool. He's my dad, man. <laughs> just be cool. Just be cool. <laughs> Yes, please. <laughs> so is there like anything else from this episode that you'd like to kind of mention that we haven't talked about? Terrible special effects when they go into Fred's mind. The weird static stuff, especially when they turn it to like the, the no signal colors or whatever, the, the like black and the yellow or whatever. Black and white gray bars. I, I remember watching this when it came out, like because I was still like week to week on Supernatural at this point or like maybe month to month as it was here and I had watched I'd binge three episodes. But I remember watching this and me going like, oof, no, not good. Yeah. 
as soon as you had to go for the one like not practical effect it was like oh yeah no we see where the budget went and we haven't really talked about it like the episode is genuinely funny like all of the looney tunes bits like really really land like there's the moment where dean dives after the main villain and like it's like you get the actual title like hunter hiroshi and villainous maximus at the bottom like it's just classic like looney tunes bits and it's just and when supernatural does that kind of stuff they really really nail it like when they try to try to start you know you think about the funny episodes of supernatural and they're almost always like universally loved right because they're just they always get it the language of those cartoons is so ingrained in us in a way that like the second dean pulled out the gun every single person watching was like we know where this is going right what like uh like second tier production team assistant person has that frying pan with Jensen Ackles face on it? Like someone had to make that and then someone had to like do something with that. Like, is that in a warehouse somewhere? Does Jensen have it? And I mean, but this is pretty supernatural, right? Like there are some things that they just don't pull off in terms of a visual effect. And CGI is often up there. It's also because I believe that they had like a three person team or something. Like it was like two or three people who were doing all the CGI for the show, which is kind of like unheard of. By the time CW starts doing all of the DC Universe stuff, like the Flash and Arrow, um, the CGI, especially in the Flash, the early seasons are so good compared to anything Supernatural has ever really done. Like, and it's just like mind boggling to me that they were on the same, like, and eventually it gets like the Flash gets super cheesy and dumb, but like every show does. It's like, you can't really complain about that. In this episode, is there anything you'd like to reflect on or feel called to do? I feel like I can be a much less severe case of Fred in the way that I use media for escapism. And like, while I don't think I've ever gone so hard or so completely disconnect myself in that way, I think it is a good reminder that I I need to come up for air sometimes and not let myself get so engrossed in film, media and TV that I like don't face the problems like it's one thing to use them as like a way to like cope or distract but unlike fred i need to like come up for air and actually face my problems and like move past them i think for me it's just a reminder not to film my flashbacks in the weird wavy greasy lens filter for real though i think the moments that sam fades out here are the moments that he's like remembering that this stuff happened right every single time it happens he has to like somebody calls him out of it like dean's like hey are you with me like are we are we doing this what what are we doing and i have a tendency to do that like in conversations nowadays like i have a tendency to just like because of my own weird stuff that i'm going through just like in the middle of a conversation with somebody just like be completely somewhere else just a reminder to like probably don't need to be thinking about like my own bs while i'm having the conversation with this person for me there's this idea of like overcompensation that we talked about a little bit with Cass and and with sam also like about how like Sam and Amelia just trying to overcompensate for like their being messes by like finding each other and like hanging on to each other and being messes together. That's something that I definitely relate a lot to where there's something going on and then all of a sudden I'll be like, okay, well, I'm going to go the complete opposite way in order to fix this problem. And at the end of the day, it's not really fixing the problem. It's just like running away from it and overcompensating for it. So I think this, this episode kind of offers a reminder of like taking a breath sometimes and being like, okay, what is the actual problem? Versus like, are you actually fixing the problem or just reacting to it? And I think that that, that's very important for me. Jeremy, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Thank you for having me back. I'm sorry Chris couldn't be here. He had a um, a Final Fantasy VII cloud-related mishap that prevented him from coming. So we're going to be doing a donation drive. We, we don't know if he's like lost a limb or whatever, but like, you know, chrislovescloud.com is where we can go to do all those donations later. Did he end up with the wrong one of the women on the date or something and it ruined his place? We need to restart or something? <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. This is always a, a blast and I, I love being on here. Y'all are my favorite Supernatural podcast. So um, I listen to you every week. Where can we find you on Twitter? I don't really post a lot on Twitter. JG Greer on Twitter. Um, I think I'm Jeremy Greer on Blue Sky. Oh, we have a website now. It's creepybutnecessary.cool. Oh, very cool. Yeah, yeah. So you can go and get all of our podcasts, including the weird one we did with about emojis for a while. What? Yeah, we have a, like a, it's a short form. We're going to review every emoji podcast. <laughs> and we got, we got like 100 episodes deep. And then um, it turned into a weird 
improv horror thing and then we didn't know how to get out of that so we ju- we, we just stopped <laughs> it's the weirdest it's the one of the weirdest podcasting experiences in my life and i love it thinking face not cool is is that is that that experience i might have to investigate that and talk to you guys about maybe restarting that or getting involved because that sounds way too much fun Go to creepy but necessary dot cool. That's that has all of our podcasts on it, um, including our most recent one about the X file that we've talked about quite a bit. That's coming out every week, and that is amazing. And people should be listening to it. By the way, just saying. This will come out in like seven weeks. Uh, it's supposed to come out May twenty fourth. So we could talk because you will have been on non human biologics by then. I will have. She's going to be our feedback guest. So we're going to cover the whole of season one. Or I guess you have been our season one guest. It was great, as usual. (laughs) We had a grand time. It was very abusing. I didn't laugh at all. Of course not. Absolutely not. With me and Chris. (laughs) This has been such a delight and so much fun to revisit Supernatural every once in a while. So thank you. This was Carrying Wayward, a supernatural podcast produced by Rochelle Castellano, hosted by Marie Vigoureau and myself, Drew Schulman. Thank you to everyone supporting us on Coffee or Patreon, especially our Bunker supporters, L, Jeremiah Thomas, and Simone. We'd also like to thank Jake Lionheart for our music and Jacqueline Tucci for additional sound editing. Head over to carryingwayward.com to become a patron or a Coffee subscriber, and for our merch store and socials. And write us a review on Apple Podcasts. Carry on our wayward friends.